we can already start the introduction. So in the meantime, uh, we can open the other features. Sure. Let's feel free do. to feel free to um, add your questions. Yeah, just use the Q and A button. I mean, hello everyone. Um, yeah, usually we are always doing a small introduction about Exa Bootcamp, and we are always asking everyone here where you're actually coming from and what's your connection to the XR space and maybe also to eye tracking. And uh, I hope we can, uh, yeah, we can still ask and we can enable the chat function because we are very curious to know who's here today. And um, yeah, let me just start with a, a small, very short introduction about Exa Bootcamp. Um, there is Ferhan, my co-founder, and me uh, here in the team, and Dokan as well. If you have any specific questions about Exa Bootcamp to us, feel free to write to us. And yeah, as you know, we are... Uh, yeah, we are in um, XR Online Academy. We are teaching virtual reality and augmented reality development skills. And we have many, many open lectures. We just started the XR Pro event series. As you may have seen, please also check on the event Eventbrite. Um, there you can find all the dates for the future XR Pro open lectures, which are always free. And you're all invited to join to learn about very specific um, topics such as eye tracking today. Mm, and yeah, so what so we are all about, what is our Exa Bootcamp DNA? Um, we really value finding the best of the best trainers. So we are handpicking our mentors that are teaching virtual reality and augmented reality development for us. And we are um, we have a very great community. So I hope all of you are already in the Exa Creators Discord server. I just saw actually that we um, that we already passed the four thousand Exa developers mark. So um, um, there is many, many people to connect with there, to introduce yourself to, and to find your future, um, yeah, co-founder, maybe teammate, or to just explore and ask questions about XR development in general. And uh, yeah, in our courses, we are very um, project, we're working on a very project-based um, way. So all our courses um, are very active. You're going to get engaged. Our trainers will give you a lot of assignments. We'll make sure that you actually learn the content that we are um, yeah, teaching. And um, yeah, so, so we have um, beginner level to advanced level courses. So even if you're a senior level XR developer, you can find um, courses which may be interesting to you, such as advanced VR interactions, rendering optimization, and HoloLens mixed reality courses. And uh, yeah, and feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. We are regularly launching new courses. And of course, at the core of XR Bootcamp is our XR Bootcamp, <laughs> which is a five months training and you can go basically from zero to hero. Uh, you will learn C Sharp in the beginning um, and of course Unity. And in the last two months, that's the heart piece of our um, course, you're going to prototype. So in the end, you're going to have four prototypes and two MVPs. And what do we actually mean with MVP? So in general, that's a minimum viable product. But that means also that you're not only developing them yourself all by yourself, like the four XR prototypes, which you're doing in the first four weeks, but you're actually going to develop them in a team. And uh, so basically you're going to be matched with other students. You're going to have like an industry project partner, so a company from the XR industry, which is going to brief you. And that, uh, so we are basically replicating the environment of a real XR studio. Mm. So yeah, and you're always invited if you're really new to the XR industry, if you just want to yeah get your um, hands dirty and want to jump in right away, we launched a free C Sharp um, with Unity course, and you can basically try out how much you like programming, how much you like programming for VR, uh, you will also try Unity, and it's all for free, and you can always sign up and just learn it. Mm. Yeah, and um, I'm also inviting you to um, check out uh, our Trustpilot course. We are very happy and always very um, proud to see that our students and our alumni are very, very happy with us, um, that they're finding jobs through us, that they are basically advancing in their careers with us. We have really amazing stories already from our past students, and uh, we hope that the story is continuing. 
And um, actually, we are quite um, even though there is the recession, of course, incoming, we're actually quite confident and we are seeing that uh, co companies are not really stopping to hire for XR positions. So that's great news, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, and from our past, uh, from our past. Uh, students, we have lots of lots of companies sending their developers to us to, of course, learn XR development. And um, that's also uh, good news because all these developers which are coming for, uh, for coming for our courses, they are also looking for new teammates, they're looking for people to work with, and they're also um, yeah, often actually taking our course and then hiring some people from our more uh, junior level classes. Uh, yeah, and this is like an overview about our, I mean, like, please feel free to download the um, XR Bootcamp curriculum on our website, you will um, see basically the overview of our courses. And um, yeah, and there's like many, um, you can get some insights on you can get also like, yeah, some feel free to actually also follow us on our social media, we are always publishing and we're also promoting our students as well. And you can basically get an insights into uh, the student projects that are being shown as uh, that are being developed by our students and what our students are basically capable of developing after finishing the course. Um, yeah, so. Uh... Yes. I mean, that's so um, far everything I wanted to mention about our courses. Um, Ferhan, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, I can tell that in addition to that, I mean, our, our vision and our goal with all these classes and open lectures um, is to disseminate the expert knowledge from the um, most like masterminds of XR development and different parts of XR. Today is also one of them. Uh, we are probably uh, inviting and hosting the top two names in terms of eye tracking. And uh, we are really excited to have Joan and Alexander today. Um, so without further ado, we can actually uh, give the stage to them. And Joan is from uh, Toby, Director of Software Partnerships. Alexander is from Starcade Arcade. So. Today is actually also special because we have both the platform side and the prototype and uh, even the studio side who are actually using this uh, platform. Uh, it will be a great opportunity to see uh, different perspectives. Uh, afterward, we will have round table that we will invite uh, other uh, eye tracking experts, uh, Tilman, uh, Yasmin and um, also Dinmer will be with us as well. Um, so afterwards, we will also take your questions. So without further ado, I would like to give the stage to Joan and Alexander. Uh, welcome to the Open Lecture Series. It's nice to kick off the XR Pro Open Lectures with you guys before the year ends. I hope uh, things are exciting for you, especially with the new headsets arriving, announcements happening. Happy to hear more. Thank you, Farron. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Quick sound check. Thumbs up, Alexander Farron, that you can hear me. I'm good. That's always the, the most difficult part in these, these days. So as Farron said, I'm the director of software partnerships at Toby. Toby is a company on a mission to improve machine man-machine interactions and we do that with eye tracking and specifically i've worked a lot in vr where we're supplying eye tracking technologies into a large range of headsets alexander good friend of mine since many years we've been talking eye tracking in various occasions over the years and last two or so been really fortunate to work together on alexander's studios game uh, Star Blazer. That's right. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. I'm Alexander Clark, founder of Starcade Arcade, 
We've released three VR games to date, Star Blazer, Virus Popper, and our most successful Space Slurpees. And today I'm going to be talking about Star Blazer. All right, Star Blazer is a real-time strategy game. It's actually the first of three VR games that we built and published. With 2023 bringing a whole new generation of headsets, we thought it was a good time to give a solid substantial update to Star Blazer, look at adding new features, new content, bring it to the new headsets. And one of the things that we're bringing is eye tracking. Star Blazer being a real-time strategy game, if you're not familiar with the genre, means that you're controlling an army. In our case, it's a fleet of ships in real-time battles. Think of it a little bit like capture the flag or space chess. And a very popular genre to compare it to is like StarCraft on the flat gaming side. So Star Blazer is a VR take on the RTS genre. Today, I'm going to be talking about three different eye tracking features that we've implemented in Star Blazer before this next update. These three features I specifically chose because, in fact, I noticed in the QA we have great questions already about what are the use cases for eye tracking? Why haven't we seen more of it? And we specifically chose these three features because sometimes you might get the question is eye tracking a nice to have or is it critical to gameplay? And in the case of Star Blazer, I think it was a critical addition, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to work so closely with Toby and develop it. So the first two use cases, contextual information and object selection, I'm going to talk about how important those are to the game, improving the gameplay, and some nice to know, you know tool tips and piece of advice on what it looked like for us to develop it. And then the third feature on UI controls, there was actually a question in Q&A about that, is how you can implement it with different menu screens. And we're gonna be ending on that one because I believe it's the most applicable to any developer and is an easy way to get started with eye tracking. So again, I think these features are important to the game. We have lots of delighters. Like one example is when you're in the title screen, you can look up at the title Star Blazer and there's like a starburst. But things like that are delighters and they're exciting ways to show off the technology. But we're going to talk today about critical additions and strong use cases, I believe, for eye tracking technology and how to implement. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is contextual information. So to understand why this is so important for our game to include this feature, I have to go back to the user feedback and the case studies that we did when we first released the game. The game was released maybe three years ago. This was well before even mobile headsets, and we we're taking it to indie game conventions and got a lot of love and support from the community. But I also got the candid feedback. Your game stresses me out. It's beautiful. I love it. I love what you're doing, but I feel stress. And people would also say, I'm terrible at this game. And we noticed that a lot of users were challenged when they first entered the game. Uh, they were losing. <laughs> and they also felt overwhelmed by the experience. And so as a developer, I believe everybody needs to take a hard look at the feedback. You can't discount it and say, well, get better. No, you can't tell your players that. You have to look and see, you know, what can I improve as a developer? And so when we really took a look at that feedback, we, we parsed it down to two big things. Real-time strategy games are overwhelming as it is. Anybody who just started playing StarCraft for the first time will immediately be lost without extensive tutorials and maybe watching some videos. That's just the nature of the genre. And then VR itself as a medium, I believe, is naturally overwhelming. You get a lot of new users to VR that aren't traditionally gamers. We've seen artists and tech enthusiasts and all types of people from different backgrounds coming to VR that maybe don't have the years of experience gaming and don't consider themselves avid gamers. And layering on top of that, the fact that VR is immersive and completely around you. Now, if you say you need to control 10 ships and watch another enemy's 10 ships and watch your fleet get destroyed and explosions all around you, it can be a stressful experience. And understanding how to control that chaos 
adds to the stress. So one of the first things when I talked to Toby was we need to be selective about what information that we give the user so that they can make the right decisions without being overwhelmed in that data. So you can see the picture on the right, that GIF, it's cycling through different overviews of what you'd see when you look at different ships. This is like on the title screen. So there's different types of ships and classes. We need the users to learn how they function, how they're used. And so in this case, we're popping up information about what that ship type and what that class is so that they can recognize it. In battle, they get even more information, such as the ship's stats, its health, its damage abilities, its special abilities. And you can very quickly tell the difference between ally ships and enemy ships. If you were to give the user all this information at once, it would be like the Times Square <laughs> equivalent of, of data, but like two inches from your face. It's too much. And so now with eye tracking, we can pinpoint where a user is looking, give them the important information at the time, and help them make strategic decisions based off of that. And at this point, um, maybe more people than I are thinking uh, about this gentleman, Tony Stark, who often comes up when we talk eye tracking uh, the first times. Seems like a lot of ideas come up quickly about how do you want to control things with your eyes? Because we had so many movies with eye control interfaces. And for those old enough to remember Minority Report, there are a lot of futuristic visions of how we can interact with computers in the future. And we spent about 20 years at Toby, both creating the technology, but also applying it in a number of different fields. So one of the things I've learned to share quickly is the right superheroes. As much as I love Tony Stark, he can be a bit of a hothead and uh, not necessarily the one to follow all the time. But the ones I like better to bring out are the X-Men. Especially if you think of Magneto, who in a sense has found his superpowers. And if you notice what he does is he focuses on an object and then he combines that with a hand gesture. And that's what we found just as a, at a very fundamental user experience level and when thinking about how to design interactions, combining the eyes, which are a visual, it's a sensory organ meant to take in information. You wanna combine that with some sort of explicit action anytime you can a hand gesture, a key press, a controller, use of a controller. Uh, otherwise, it quite easily becomes Cyclops. If you remember the first, first scene when he gets his powers, it's not, not exactly in control until he gets his headset where he has that button to control his superpowers. So I just wanted to leave you with that, that image because uh, I think it's helped a lot of developers. It definitely has helped and it's something that I'm gonna reference in this lecture for sure. So get that image of Cyclops in your mind because I think it's a good one. And so one of the first things I wanted to talk about was with this contextual information, you do have to find a balance between the timing of it. And timing is absolutely critical. And if there's one thing that you take away from this, it would be my emphasis on user testing with all of these features and how critically important it is to test these features with users to build the right experience and that it's going to be iterative. So with eye tracking, whenever you're giving information or data, I would say you're balancing on a knife, like is it too slow or is it too fast? And let me explain like the good and bad of each. If it's too slow, users aren't gonna notice that they have eye tracking. And in general, you don't want them to like be, you don't want it to be super obvious, but at the same time, you do want them to know that it's there. So in our use case, you know, let's say like the menu screen where you're learning about the different types of ships. If that experience is too slow, and when we first started developing, it definitely was, it was one of the iterations, one of our user testers would look around the scene and they weren't looking long enough at the ships for them to trigger an interaction. They would just pass right over it and they didn't know that they were missing out on critical information. And then 
me, you know, being an engineer, I'm like, well, if you stare at it, you, you'll see what it's trying to show. Um, but then if you, you know, if you ask them afterwards, you'd be like, well, what did you think of the eye tracking? And then they said, what eye tracking? That's when, you know, the interaction is too slow. So then the flip side, do you want it instantaneous? And the, abs the answer to that is absolutely not. So let's reference that picture of Cyclops. It can feel uncontrollable and extremely unnerving when a user has eye tracking features within the program, but then everything that they look at immediately has a reaction. We call this like the Midas touch, you know, the reference to like the, the person who everything he touched turned to gold and I believe he died because his food turned to gold. <laughs> um, it, it, it's gonna feel like that if you're not careful. You don't want things to be extremely responsive to the extent that it just it's flashy without providing substantial like data and information. And one of the other things to keep in mind is like your peripherals. Sometimes a user may not be looking like directly, directly at an object. Um, and if you're not holding the information there long enough, then it's just going to flash and go away and it's going to be a very chaotic experience. And so talking through like the specifics of the timing. So this is like some of the details that I just want to share with, you know, the developers and people choosing to work in this space. You definitely want to keep in mind that there's multiple layers to the timing. So the first layer that I want to point out is the trigger layer. How long do you wait before you actually trigger something? And these are examples of time variables that we put in, but it could be very different for your application, and that's where the user testing comes in. So for us, around a tenth of a second means that a user has looked at an object. If it was faster than that, then everywhere they looked, you know, in like a passing sense would, would, would trigger it again, be chaotic. So for us, that's what we know. The user has looked at an object, and we say, okay, now let's trigger an interaction. Then we have a span of time which has to be included and accounted for, for the animation. Because the animation itself, you can see there's like a UI image popping up. This takes time. And again, if you made that too slow, a user may look away before that animation finished and they saw the data that you were trying to present them with. So that animation pops up, know the length of it, test the length of it. And then the next section is if it pauses. And at this point, we chose to hold that data up until we know that another selection has been made. So a user could look away into an empty area. I show on the fourth picture, you know, the user's kind of looking to the side. In that case, you, like, we have the information that says, user's not looking at this ship anymore. However, they're also not looking at another ship. So in that case, we actually hold the data and information up so that it's in their peripherals, which leads to a more comfortable experience before finally, if they look at a new ship, we start the sequence over with that ship and we can close the animation on the previous ship. And so again, this is our application and some of the specifics of us, of it, how we avoid the x-ray vision. It may be different for your game or for your application. So user testing, critically important. The next feature that I want to talk about is object selection. So I mentioned you're trying to control ships in real time battle. And for an RTS, this would already be challenging. You're uh, like, they, they measure with like the pro players how fast they can click a screen. Okay, well now turn that three dimensional because you're having an entire 3D arena around you where you have to point and you have to select the ship that you want to first select and then you have to select a ship that you want to target and so it's a lot of interaction but again it's a real-time battle so we wanted a way to speed up that interaction because we want users to feel empowered and we want users to feel like I can control my fleet before it blows up and so in the case of object selection our goal was we want to add assistance to selecting the ships whenever a user is looking at them. Because usually, if a user is looking at a ship, they have intention to select it, to interact with it, whether it's to choose it from their fleet or it's to choose an enemy ship to target. And so you can see in the GIF below, 
the circle represents where the eyes are looking. And in this case, the highlight of which ship is being highlighted and you can then select is changing depending on where the user is looking. So in that case, they don't have to move the arm completely over to select it. And we're gonna explain also as well why it's so important to enable eyes versus just hands. But before we get to that, I also wanna point out um, some specifics on the technical side of what we do for that selection. So many of you probably begun your Unity courses or maybe Unity pros. And in general for game development, you have what we call colliders. These are 3D invisible objects that detect if something is interacting. Uh, sometimes it could be like a physical collision. In our case, it's actually the eye gazing. It's like a ray cast of where the eyes are looking. And so the advice that I wanna give you today is on how to build your colliders around the object. So the example that I'm showing here is we've got a medic ship and let's look first at the left image. That green collider is the trigger area for the ship itself. So ideally when we got started, the interaction that we wanted was when you look at the ship, it triggers the UI, right? What we talked about with the contextual information. And then you can see other information shows up on the screen. We have the health stats and the defense stats up on the top. And then we have the, the shield value of how much health is remaining on the bottom part. And so those pop up when a user looks at a ship, which then gives them extra information, but again, refines it to just the ship that they're looking at. Now, one thing that you'll need to do is you have to add colliders to the UI elements that have then popped up. And because if you think about it, if, if I was to look at the ship first, and then I look down at the health stats, if there was another ship behind those health stats, it may select that ship. So again, we're back to Cyclops, chaotic, um, eye, eye gazing, laser vision. And so to avoid that, you wanna make sure your UI elements themselves have colliders, if nothing else, to stop the, the ray cast and to stop the gazing so that it's very clear that we looked at the ship first, but now we're looking at the ship plus its UI. And then for us specifically, we also found that it made more sense not to do too much interaction between like sub colliders of this UI that popped up. Um, so for instance, I had like the health expand and stuff like that when you looked at it, but there is a level of granularity where it becomes too much and it's too refined, which again, leads back to that chaos. You'll probably hear me say that word a lot. Um, so in our case, we just say, all right, when you look at the ship, once the UI pops up, we add the colliders to it. If you look at those colliders, it's considered that you're looking at the whole ship. We, you know, UI and all. We can put animations, we can cycle through UI if we want to, but we don't wanna be overly responsive on the UI within it and break that down too much into smaller colliders. And part of what you're talking about here, Alexander, goes back to how the eyes work. Um, I thought I'd geek out for a second since Toby has had the pleasure of using our own technology for a good 20 years. We've we've uh, used it in research ourselves and, and there are a lot of researchers out in the world who study human behavior with our technologies. So what you see on the video here is an actual recording with an in-field set of research glasses with eye tracking. So the red dot here obviously is where the user is looking um, and it's synchronized with the video. So what one interesting thing about the eyes here is the fact that the eyes always lead. If you notice here, the red dot jumps to the objects that the user is pointing to and the button they're touching a little bit before they actually turn to their head and start to reach. And this is a part of the reason why you want a bit of colliders, both, both spatially and temporal as well, uh, to take this in, um, um, into account. There is also another really, really nifty way of designing interactions that take advantage of this. The, the fact that the eyes always are ahead of the hands. If you consider a regular 
controller laser pointer type interaction in VR today and break it down to its elements, what actually happens is that the user looks at the object, then they point a laser pointer with a controller to it, and then you have them trigger some sort of command with a button. But with eye tracking, since we already know where the user is going to point, we can actually get rid of that step. And going from a three-step look, point, click kind of paradigm to a much more neutral and effortless look and click paradigm. And as, as you'll see with Alexander here, how, how they've done it, this also it coexists beautifully with with controllers. So this is not a one or the other, but this is a way of enhancing the interactions, really. Yes, absolutely. And so we found that was really important, important just to touch on what he said, is we do let users manually override whatever they point to, we assume is the priority. Because honestly, it takes more effort to lift your hand and point to something than it does to look at something. And so if a user is intentionally pointing to a ship, we will always prioritize that. However, if there's no active hand interaction and then they choose to just look at something, then at that point, we'll highlight it, we'll <clears throat> add extra information, we'll tee up the selection, but we still leave the choice in their hands with using a trigger to select the ship and to make the decision to interact with it. And then the third and final feature that I want to talk about today and give some advice on is around UI controls. And the reason I picked this one to include as well as pick this one for last is because it's, in my opinion, the simplest, uh, but also the most common eye tracking feature that we implemented. And I believe any developer content creator could take advantage of this. If you wanted to get started with eye tracking technology, most content is going to have some sort of menus or interactions and eye gazing takes it to the next level of, of interaction, especially like in VR, we're trying to make things more immersive. And so it makes sense. We don't want to completely go back to like a mouse pointer era. So if we can look at menu items to interact with them, then it provides a distinct advantage. And most of the users, when, once we did our testing, we would find that people prefer to just use the eye gazing and the trigger. Um, once people get used to it, you actually don't see a lot of the old type of pointing with the laser pointer and selecting items because the eye tracking makes it so fast and so intuitive. And we kind of mentioned this, but again, this is super important, especially when talking about your UI controls is you really want to prioritize hand actions and place your eye gazing as secondary. The user is choosing to interact with their hands. If they reach up, if they point to something, if they go to select it, if they pull the trigger, all these are very intentional interactions that they saw something, their mind chose to interact with it, and then they fired off the muscles in their body to interact with it. So they made that choice, and you want to honor that decision. If you just completely take away the reins and go with the eye gazing, where they what they may look at may not match their intention or what they desire to do. And for any game or application, uh, you don't want to do contrary to what the user was trying to do in its interaction. So again, for us, this means on the ships, if you are looking at a ship, but you are pointing to a different ship, we will assume you are trying to highlight the other ship. And our pro players definitely could do that. You could be watching an enemy ship, point to the ship beside you. That'd be pretty awesome. <laughs> and so we don't want to take away that game winning moment from anybody. So we'll prioritize the pointing and the selection with there. And you'd want to do the same with any types of buttons or content that you include in, in your game or program. And I think this extends actually to other control modalities as well. As we move, obviously, as we move forward in the XR space, where uh, there is more hand gestures, there is voice recognition, like some, like Chris mentioned here in the in the chat, uh, and those are definitely options to control and and 
and issue user commands. But I think you want to keep in mind that concept of user intentionality that Alex brings up, like how certain can we be that of the user intent in these different modalities. And the hands are typically very intentional. We do things with their hands. You know, we have fine motor skills that are designed by nature to do very, be very precise. Um, voice ab absolutely works. Uh, I would, I would think, claim that it's probably a, we can be less certain of the intentionality of, of a voice command than the press of a button typically. Um, but in some cases, the hands are busy with others. In some use cases, you might have those kind of restrictions that they're, quote unquote, the user don't have any hands available for one reason or the other. And then voice can be a perfectly good alternative. Um, but keeping that level of intentionality in mind in your design, I think, is 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 a good go a, a good handrail to stay with. Um, and with that, I thought we'd wrap up. So there are a lot of new poss possibilities coming with eye tracking. Um, we had some questions about other things as well, but the core things that Alexander and his team has built in Starblazer is really uh, working for natural interaction and attentive UI um, increasing both the immersion, the feeling that we are in there and have magical superpowers. And then also the UI, which in a sense are overlaid on the 3D experience often, um, at least in the case of 2D interfaces, uh, they're sort of, they're not really part of the immersion usually. Um, there are other, other really strong concepts that we see being played around with as well that I wanted to mention, um, including social awareness, having avatars, NPCs, and uh, mirror images of yourself actually behave like the user. There's a, it's a huge difference watching yourself in the mirror with a blank thousand miles stare like this versus actually having real eye movements and real, um, real blinks and so on it's it makes things so much more alive in in any context immersive graphics is another area where there's a lot happening in these days this usually boils down to what's called foveated rendering today a lot of the new headsets leverage this as a way of improving the frame rate capabilities of the headsets these headsets if if you know they have we basically cram in 4K displays, two of them. So like the big monitors that some some of you probably ha are looking at right now, we take two of those, cram them into tiny size and put them in front of the eyes. So the, just the raw compute needed to render a, a realistic VR experience at high frame rate is very high. And the GPUs of today are actually struggling. So what eye tracking enables then is to say, hey, the eye, the physical eye actually only has high resolution at a very small area. It's about the size of your thumbnail at arm's distance. That's as much as you see high resolution. The rest, we can actually downgrade the, rest, the rendering and save GPU load so we can reuse some other, some other way. So eye tracking and foveated rendering, that sense, actually improves the frame rate in general. And then last but not least, we also touched on actionable insights, ways of using this information in player testing, in user experience research, um, and different types of studies uh, with of typically of more research-like character. The eyes are the window to the soul and have hu give huge uh, information about human behavior and preferences. There is There was a question about privacy here, and that is a growing area um, of legislation, regulation, but also self-regulation, especially on the hardware manufacturer side. So once you go out and develop and start looking into the SDKs, what you quite often will notice is that hardware manufacturers um, and companies like Toby in our SDKs, you'll see very clearly, uh, very clear directions on how to communicate the use of eye tracking for analytics uh, to the end users. So these are a couple of the areas where 
you'll see a lot of fun things happening in the application on the application side um, throughout 2023. Some of the more exciting um, news for us as a eye tracking technology provider is PlayStation VR 2 that has eye tracking integrated uh, from Toby. So I just realized it is on pre-order and I just get the Sony PlayStation just sent out the first batch of emails, at least in the US, to sign up and, uh, for a headset and get it shipped in February. So at least I'm looking forward very much to that. Great. And the Starblazer update with all the features that we talked about, that'll be coming this spring. Definitely, if you want to keep up to date on the information, please follow us on social media. Our company is 100% bootstrapped, and I do majority of all the development myself. So any types of follows or support you can give on social media means a lot. I'll drop our link tree in the chat. Um, it goes a long way, and we appreciate it. Thank so you. Thanks for today. And yeah. Back to you, Farron. Yeah, thank you for this nice presentation. At least it gives us quite a bit of uh, background for those who are new to eye tracking. There are also a lot of um, UX related opportunities that we have seen here. And we are looking forward to hearing more from the audience today. As usual, we have a lot of questions. These open lectures are known for question like a uh, uh, flow a lot of questions coming up right now so I will try to be as quick as possible to be mindful of the time but uh, using the opportunity I would love to give the stage actually to our experts that joining us from uh, for the round table um, maybe you know some of them already um, Dilmer uh, Valencios hi Dilmer how are you you have probably known him with his tutorials on YouTube. He's the one. If there's an SDK release, this means that Dilmer will release in a few days. So everyone in our community looking forward to his uh, tutorials. Welcome, Dilmer. Hey, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Fernand. And, and I've been looking at the, at the examples from the community, and it's really inspiring to see what people are creating. So really cool and a uh, round of applause to everybody and also my respect to everybody on the panel. Um, I, am a, I admire a lot of people that are here. So uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you, Dilmer. Uh, Tilman is also uh, supporting us in some of our uh, courses and uh, he's also an expert on not only eye tracking, but generally on the general uh, XR prototyping. Uh, Tilman, welcome to the round table. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Tillman. Yeah, I've been working in, with VR for um, six, seven years, something like that. And for me, the interesting thing about VR is um, how easy it is accessible to everyone. So, um, how, for example, like a lot of people think like it's for gamers, but um, the first uh, product I really worked on, really brought to market, was actually for the opposite was the case where we built a product where you can very quickly in VR create your own. Um, version like in Minecraft basically of an assembly station and that um, was very popular especially with the people in the factories that don't uh, like computers at all because th now they can actually express themselves really well and for me eye tracking and the other technologies that uh, the biometric technologies are really the next step in that um, direction so um, being able to understand what the user thinks the mental state where they look those type of things I think will make it even more accessible uh, the computer generally um if it is in a vr headset with an eye tracker so that's why i'm so interested in the space and for the last year i've been working at soma reality a company where we look um not so much at the gaze what we discussed today but more at the pupil size to understand um yeah more about the mental state of the user and to see like how we can uh work with the software um how we can make the software understand the user and adapt itself to the software and through that work I also looked a lot at the work uh, Yasmin did. So um, I thought that was really exciting work, especially if you're thinking about the huge amount of data you will get um, uh, when you do eye tracking in VR and interactive environment over a longer amount of time. So I was really happy that uh, we can all be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dilman. Uh, Yasmin with, with us today as well. Uh, I haven't get the chance to also talk with you in person, but uh, I know that you have a lot of 
especially heat map related use cases uh, from Tillman. So um, we are curious to hear more about that as well. I just posted a use case from Shopify. They started to use uh, heat map, 3D heat map for uh, merchants, but happy to hear from your perspective, Yasmin. Yes, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm Yasmin. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Computer Science at University of Osnabrück. So um, I do my research mostly with eye tracking and virtual reality. And um, for me, of course, analysis of eye tracking data is especially interesting. Um, and we actually developed a new way to, to look at these eye tracking data recorded in VR using graph theory or network theory, because actually um, heat maps can be very tricky. So um, we actually argue for this uh, new approach um, that uses different data. Um, and so far, I have been mostly involved in um, projects every like where we build virtual cities uh, for people to so we could observe people navigating and understand better how people navigate in virtual environments. Um, and my most recent project was actually a collaboration with an artist, and we built like an artwork where two people are together in VR, and the art reacts to their gaze. So um, that is that is more of um, of a project where also eye tracking is interesting in itself because the artwork will transform form if two people look at the same location and then it will react to the collaborative gaze of um of the visitors um and yes i'm very happy to be here and share my perspective on um data analysis especially thank you yasmin i i believe there are actually a lot of people from the research side as well in the audience right now we can see from the introductions so it will be also helpful not only for prototypers, XR enthusiasts, but also for the researchers. By the way, um, Dilmer just uh, released the Movement SDK uh, video in case you haven't. I just posted Dilmer's uh, video there on the chat. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's working on something Tracking related, let's not give away so much, but it's definitely something tracking. So uh, I hope we will be able to see that, right, in, my, in a few days. Yeah, so I've been, I've been luckily working with Meta on some new videos. So uh, there's going to be a lot of things on the Movement SDK. Uh, funny enough, I'm learning to use Blender right now and creating blend shapes and creating a skeleton. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is just going through Blender and then going into that process. And then once I understand the process, I'll be building a new video. So heads up, it, it'll it'll probably come in the next two to three days. So I'll send it to you firsthand and you can share it with the community. Definitely, definitely. Perfect, perfect. So without further ado, I would like to open the stage to uh, like questions. Uh, of course, uh, our experts, you are also free to ask questions, contribute, answer as well, uh, or bring your own perspective. But uh, we will try our best to cover as many questions as possible. Uh, I'm pretty sure that these questions will also trigger new ones. So let's see how much, how many of them that we can cover. Okay, so let's try to be quickly answering uh, as much as we can, if it's okay for you, for our experts. So uh, there are actually some of them already being answered. So uh, I will uh, start from the beginning. So um, how can we do? How can we do clicking text input via eye tracking? Um, any quick advice on that? I think, again, coming back to having an intention, clicking, I, I do think that you want to keep it as close to the hands as possible. Uh, if that's a button or a gesture, that's good. Then uh, there are a lot of research if you're thinking, how do I do virtual keyboards? I think that is a challenging problem that we've looked at in computers for quite a time. And, and it's, Anyway, since our since our phones got this small and like the keyboard's tiny, that has started to become a problem. Um, voice is definitely a huge help to me. Um, there are see-through cameras will do a lot for how to integrate keyboards inside the VR environment. And I think Logitech even has like tracked keyboards that appear virtually in exactly the same place in the VR world. So you can get that tactile uh, feeling as well. So there's a couple of things that I think we'll see going forward. Perfect. Uh, there's one question. Why hasn't eye tracking been used for UX general navigation in XR headsets like the Quest Pro? 
uh, is it an issue for reliability? Uh, I can quickly answer that. I mean, it's just as you see, the adoption is still on the way. That we are we can we are nowhere near on mass adoption on headsets, and that also brings that we are nowhere near in adoption of uh, the uh, eye tracking as well. Um, but maybe one question as a follow up: uh, How many years that we need to see and at least? When you look at the headsets, uh, how many years that we need for 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 uh, really like maybe fifty percent, sixty percent of the applications, either enterprise or games, are benefiting from eye tracking? I don't know what the rest of the panel says, but for me, new technology entering the market is is very much a cycle between applications and hardware you need more hardware penetration for it to be worthwhile developing applications and you need there as a hardware manufacturer you need um, an ecosystem of applications that leverage new technology in order to invest in getting into the hardware and that tends to go like step by step broader and broader and broader and eye tracking has been around in headsets for five to six years by now um, with the PlayStation VR 2, we're obviously going to get a huge install base, really motivating the application ecosystem to develop more. So if the, the ball is rolling downhill from here, then how quickly it go? I think it's hard to say, but we know yeah. what the big man Any other comments on that? Needed. Perfect. Any other comments from so other experts? My business perspective on that was when I was thinking about the business opportunity, kind of moving into the eye tracking space and also other things like EEG and so on. I thought eye tracking is really, personally, I think it is really likely uh, outcome where eye tracking will be used in all VR headsets in a couple of years. And that kind of all application, and I kind of would estimate that with EEG or other things it might be too expensive, might take much longer, but with eye tracking, I think it's really uh, very quickly gonna, like five years from now, I think most VR headsets, not all of them are gonna use eye tracking. And I think there's gonna be a lot of support, um, kind of frameworks using it. And working on it now, I think really it's the interesting time where you can uh, explore um, what kind of kind of can define the space, can figure out what can be done with it. And I think if you uh, go, go into iDrick in five or ten years from now, you'll mostly uh, be able to use frameworks though. Perfect. Any other comments on that? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, I think, and, and maybe most of you know it, but uh, with the new release of MRTK, that was something that was already kind of like part of the part of the pro, part of the framework. So it's been slowly getting getting into different frameworks, and and I think when I saw it, I, I tested it with BCI with brain computers, where it was kind of like under trying to understand where your eye was for selection of, and I didn't really see it. I'm like, oh, is this get, is this actually eye tracking, or is it really reading my brain? Like, and a lot of people were confused. Like, you can do it with eye tracking, and anyways, I started experimenting with MRTK and like seeing it, like how simple use cases where you're just looking at a UI, a, a canvas, something as that, that shows you a glow, like things like that, where you can combine that with a gesture. It's, I think it's gonna be really helpful, like going long-term, instead of trying to find all these complicated use cases, like I see in some of the comments where it says, hey, can we use it for face expressions and, it's coming, uh, the new release of uh, Movement SDK, uh, it is uh, has a face detector in there as well in combination with eye tracking. So anyways, I'm kind of getting derailed, but I'm really excited about the technology going forward. No, but I think you're on something, Dilma. There there are a lot of frameworks coming out. The, mm -hmm. You're referring to mix, mix, mixed reality toolkits, right? The open source project. Mm -hmm. It sprang out of Microsoft, if I'm, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Nice. And Unity have their XR interaction toolkit that mm -hmm. they worked on for a long time. Um, they, I think they released a new version of Unity just this week with mm -hmm. some updates and support for foveated rendering. And they'll be talking about the next version of XRI toolkit since May or something like that and have a lot of really, really cool samples in there. So I would really encourage anybody who's into Unity, keep an eye out for Unity's XRI toolkit, have a look at... Microsoft um, Mixed Reality Toolkit. There are a lot of really, really nifty tools. Um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel at all. One thing that uh, might be interesting right now, as far as I understand, the interaction frameworks are different than 
like eye tracking is involved, but uh, what we are seeing is especially uh, the hand eye coordination, right? That we are getting, I think this, there is still uh, unlocked potential that I'm seeing there that we may need to maybe consider that whenever we collect input data, uh, how we can maybe collect them in the way that can actually help the experience uh, or even the rendering, like a local rendering, et cetera, much better. Um, are you seeing that there will be a much more like a seamless experience between this tracking of uh, input data from eye tracking and hand tracking, and it will even make our experience better or seamless? Any comment on that? Yeah, I, I think like like, like to me the combination of like I don't want to see like selecting things with my eyes. It just doesn't feel natural. But when you combine it with hands, uh, that's when you start to see, okay, yeah, this 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 works, especially with with what I said with MRTK three, uh, very little subtle things that you start to capture with the information that you're getting from from your eyes. It's not. Uh, it's, it's not something that you're like like putting in front of the user and it's not complicated. It's something very uh, natural, right? Like you're looking around and, and certain things are starting to highlight, maybe a little subtle glow. And then it kind of, through wizards and things like that, you kind of start using your hands to do maybe a pinch to move it to the right or selections like that. So so I see like the, the hand tracking and, and eye tracking uh, become uh, pretty big. I mean, it, uh, in the next few years, it's just like, I really recommend you guys test out MRT, MRTK3 and, and and test out the demo scene and and just test it. You see how it changes. Like you're, you're going to start to see, oh, this, is, this can be useful, right? Like it can also help the experience with just little things that you start adding to your, you know, to your games and to your apps. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Johan, you already start sharing the links. So if uh, our experts can also share the links of the documentation or tutorials, it will be great. So our team, uh, our community can also benefit from that. Let me let me continue with the uh, other question, next question. So in my experience doing eye tracking for more action and sport oriented titles, there is both a strong performance cost and the cognitive information load cost for players, especially in busy scenes with lots of information. How do you balance the change in information load and CPU, GPU costs as scenes go from cluttered to lightly populated? It's, uh, I think the, the, U, the UI part, Alexander, is perfect to talk about the CPU, GPU load. I can speak to mo today most big HMDs uh, have the eye tracking algorithm compute separately on a DSP on, on the SOC. So it, it really doesn't conflict with anything the application developer does anymore. But for cognitive load, I think Alexander has spent a lot of time on it. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the conversations that we first had when we started talking with Toby about like, where do we want to focus eye tracking? And you're right that the cognitive, I mean, the foveated rendering for performance is critical for a lot of games. For us, it wasn't because we had already like optimized for mobile headsets. And so for us, it was more about the cognitive load of how do we streamline the information to the user so that it's not overwhelming. And so in that case, in terms of how we handle it, we have like the absolute most minimal UI for areas that you're not looking on. There's a few places where you need UI in your peripherals, such as we realize, okay, it's okay if ships are battling each other, but we still need to give indication of enemy versus ally ships. So there's like a faint red outline over enemy ships so that even if it's in your peripherals and you're not looking at it directly, you still know who's good, who's bad, but we don't overdo it. We don't put health stats, we don't put damage stats, anything like that in your peripherals because there's no need for it. You don't, you're not really gonna be looking at that information anyway. If you look directly at a ship, then we feed you the extra information. We give the information so that you can make those strategic decisions. And then in terms of how we scale that between a battle of three ships versus 20 ships, well, it's just like that. We're only, you're only looking at one ship at a time. And as long as it's, it's there in center of your focus, then we just provide the information for that ship. Perfect. 
Thank you. I actually realized on that, Tillman, you, what uh, summer reality does is it can be a super interesting input here as, as well to like gauging cognitive load. Yeah, so the experience I had with that is um, when I was working on um, designing uh, kind of small gameplay. So I have only done small gameplay, um, so some UI, some level design, some gameplay elements, and understanding whilst developing that, understanding uh, with eye tracking what the cognitive load is at runtime. So we do that at runtime, we understand um, how, so basically what we do with cognitive load is um, we filter out the, uh, so the pupil size, I can't see it with my glass, but mostly reacts, the pupil size mostly reacts to light. And then we filter out the influence of light. We take the um, rest of the changes in pupil size to be um, uh, to be the cognitive load of the, uh, the user currently experiences at runtime. Um, to work with that, um, you will need the uh, Ocumen license from Toby actually um, to be able to get to the uh, the data from the headset because of the privacy concerns. Um, so it doesn't work on all headsets, um, but when it works, it's really helpful for designing the level. So I found that um, quite interesting to, especially if I have someone else testing the game and I can understand um, their attention and their cognitive load. And I, then I can do like a, a play testing session, um, both for gameplay, like understanding whether the user is overwhelmed right now, or maybe not challenged enough by the level. And also for a level design, uh, for example, if you think of an escape room game or so, that would make a lot of sense. Also, that's actually for um, the industry application I mentioned before, where we design workplaces there, actually, that's also what they do there. They um, look at the workplace in VR and look at what pe how people interact with it, and they want to understand the attention and cognitive load at each step in the work. So both, I think, for serious applications where you're actually examining a workplace, as well as for uh, level design or game design, it can be really interesting to understand what the player is doing uh, at more detail. Perfect. Mm, so I can add something to that. Yeah. Um, so I think whenever you think about including eye tracking in something that is more than just observational, but actually interactive, you also need to consider that we need the eyes also to just see things, scan the environment. So whenever um, I, um, uh, as, as a user, I need to focus on something, to do something with it, of course, I can't scan the environment. And then also this, 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 observation, this perception we have of our world is actually also a little bit of an illusion because our eyes are constantly moving. So if I actually try to have someone with eye tracking looking on some specific um, location for a very long time, that might be quite difficult because just of how we work, how our biology works and, and how our eyes are generating the images that, that we are having. So um, I think it's it's important to consider that uh, people need to be able to look around and then what is intuitive and what is actually quite difficult because the eye doesn't usually stay very long on one spot, right? So that is like one thing to consider if you're actually thinking about doing um, some interactive things uh, during runtime, for example. And then something else that is actually um, very interesting if you think about eye tracking is that you can really observe, um, as Tillman already said, what people um, attend to in your game, right? So you can do some checks after, like what do people actually look at in my game? What do they look at before they do certain options, like what or certain actions, right? So um, eye tracking is very interesting in, in several senses, but you always need to also consider what are the bio biological requirements first, right? Because if you go against them, it will get very uncomfortable and very unintuitive, even though gaze itself is something very intuitive. Um, especially if you think also about social interactions, right? Um, for example, uh, being able to look at the same location develops in babies way earlier than, for example, verbal communication, right? So gaze is really something very interactive and very intuitive, um, but it has always this duality of biological needs to see the environment, um, and you can't go against that. And then also all the other functions can have like this intuitive, oh, I look there, so I'm interested in that. Um, but we also know that planning makes usually eyes move faster than what you actually do. So if you observe people um, doing things, usually the eyes will be first, the head will follow, and then the hand will follow to do something, right? So um, it is important to consider uh, also these, these biological aspects when you're designing your game that might not always match with your intuition because our perception is not 
always what our eyes are doing. Yeah, but, but this is a very, very important uh, topic, Yasmin, because um, in that's the thing that I was about to tell or I just mentioned, like our SDKs are right now so much isolated from each other, right? What if we actually have like a much more uh, like overarching uh, SDK that these patterns of your hand, hand movement, head movement and eye tracking, right? data is actually combined that will give you a meaningful intention data that will actually help so i'm actually now uh moving my eye because i will move my head right is different than i'm moving my eye because i want to look at somewhere right so this kind of like intention data if we can i'm sure that right now uh, our platform engineers are really collecting a lot of data right now from the end user since it's getting much more uh, adoption, but this is a very important part. Even that should be maybe solved in the SDK part before coming to the prototyper or uh, game or app designer part, right? That if you can have much more intention data, you can actually understand, okay, now the person is looking around. It's not intentionally looking one menu item. You can actually, uh, use this as an input data, you should also understand maybe, like look at, for example, hand tracking, right? Whenever it's released, um, hands put 1.0, right, Dilmer? Uh, it was, look at that situation, and right now, we can even bring our two hands together, et cetera. So, of course, it's like a computer vision tech, but still, uh, there are a lot of data that needs to be um, analyzed that you can create some patterns and understand how, what is the intention of the user there and then create um, some kind of like a meaningful SDKs accordingly. Uh, I think we still have need maybe a few more years as Tinman mentioned, so that it will be also used in the best way possible, at least combining all these three uh, tracking data. And the side tracking a little bit, one thing I thought uh, when I saw the presentation would be really exciting if you have like just a basic model of where people are, what they um, gonna do, or um, I think is to use uh, the voice, to have a voice in the computer yeah. to say, tell you something. I would like if you, if for example, played Rick and Morty, a game where uh, there's two characters that very often comment on what you as a player are doing. And I, I think, I don't know how would it actually play out, but I think it would be very interesting if if you, as a programmer, have a, some idea of whether uh, what the user is gonna do next, you can have small voice lines um, interacting with the intention of the user before they actually do something. And I thought that could be really cool. I haven't tried it myself, but I thought that was um, could be really interesting to just use um, the voice uh, of the... Ja Jamie from the chat actually contributed very nicely. There is a lot of human computer interaction research papers already out there. Yasmin, maybe you also already uh, go over there. I think it's all about how we can bring these uh, learnings you know, uh, from the research to the directly to the applied directly to our end user. So uh, we we hope to to bring that implement that uh, by the platforms and SDK creators. Uh, but I think these kind of sessions will really help everyone to to move forward. So and um, there, yeah, go ahead. To add to that, there there is a lot of happening. Dilma mentioned that those those SDKs, MRTK three units, XRI. Uh, Toby's done a lot of things in history. There is a lot of things happening. It doesn't happen overnight, though. Yeah. This is, <laughs> I, it, it takes a village um, to raise a child. And I think everybody who's on here now is, is really excited about the technology coming out. So, in a sense, it's, it's all of us that contri contribute. So, again, go support the developers who, who are making these standardizations and these toolkits. Exactly. Go tinker on yourself, share in the community. Um, that's exactly. how this is going to happen. It's going to be a few exciting years now, I think. Perfect. So let me let me continue with the questions. Uh, why isn't AI tracking used for web interactions? Is there any use case do you have on your side or any anything you have seen? Or does it make sense as well? Absolutely. Uh, eye tracking has been used for a lot of interactions, both in in um, in monitor and, and screen based eye tracking. And there, there was another comment in the chat that we've Toby has large history in accessibility solutions for people with severe physical uh, disabilities, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a lot happening there. And um, when it comes to like 
general web um, adoption, then you're coming back to this, how, how many devices do you have yeah. out there? We're going to get into an area where a lot of the XR devices are going to have it, um, but it, this technology has not been part of the general PC trend for the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, so. Jamie has one more question. When it comes time to do the UI UX iteration testing, did you use tooling to feedback eye tracking into more traditional playtesting feedback uh, reports like heat maps? If not, what was useful for getting quantitative to, uh, feedback to tie with players' qualitative experience feedback? Um, maybe Yasmin also, if there is any uh, thing that you can add to this. So it's sorry, I'm very sorry. I was actually looking up papers for that one person, so I missed okay, the first okay. part of the question. Okay, so <laughs> it's just a, repeat that. yeah, it's in the in the first question. So did you use tooling to feedback eye tracking into more traditional playtesting feedback reports like heat maps? If not, what was useful for getting quantitative feedback to tie with players' qualitative experience feedback? Well, I'm not in game development, right? So what I'm interested in is just understanding um, humans better. Um, and uh, what we were specifically interested in was how do people learn a new city? Like if you drop people in a new city, how do they learn something? Um, so we essentially wanted to know what do they look at? Because it tells us something like what, what people look at that is also what they process in their brain. And that tells us something about how they're learning. Um, and I think in general, it doesn't really matter if it's um, research related or game related. If you want to find out something about your user's behavior based on eye tracking um, and you do that in VR, you run into some problems. Because the, the biggest or the, the, the most important feature that um, separates VR from typical eye tracking cases is that we are actually, we have freedom of movement, right? People can look wherever they want to look and they can move around. So if you think about heat maps, heat maps usually display some kind of image and then you plot on top of it where people are looking. Now, if you are in VR, people look at different things at different times and they look at it from different angles. So, of course, you can still create heat maps. You can still determine um, based on colliders and using raycasts, for example, what people looked at. And then you can maybe display some kind of bubble or something. You can might make it even immersive that people can walk around and then see where other people have been looking at, right? But there are also some problems because it will look very different if you look from one side or if you turn around or you look from different sides, right? So um, for you to draw conclusions or even compare users will be very difficult. So what we instead propose is to somehow abstract this data, right? In our case, we had actually 90 minutes for each person being in this virtual city walking around where we get that eye tracking data. And um, if you think about uh, how I moves, like you have get a lot of data points, right? And everyone does something different. One person walks first to the north, one person walks to the south, uh, people look at different things, right? Um, and so what we propose is to, to think of this, um, this whole uh, process as um, a network, right? Um, where we have some things that are interesting to us, like objects. In our case, it was houses. Um, and then what we want to do is, in our case, we were interested in how do people, like, do people look directly from one house to another? Because we believe that you have some kind of information, right? It's interesting what you do one after another, how you connect things. Um, and we essentially then create graphs, so networks, um, where we represent the whole city with all the houses based on whether people not looked at a house and whether or not they made a direct gaze to another house directly after or before, right? Um, and then we end up with, with this whole network where we have these nodes of viewed houses and then um, connections between them if people look directly from one house to another. And that is quite interesting because we end up with one structure, one abstract representation of the data for each participant, or in our in, in the case of games, right, user. Um, and then you have some kind of data form where you can compare users independent of their freedom of movement and independent of what they did at what time of the game, right? Um, and so that is something quite interesting because, of course, in our case, we did it with houses, but it doesn't really matter. It's more about 
uh, finding out what is the interesting aspects you want to know if people look at them or not and then some kind of metric how you create these relations right if you're interested in um maybe do they always look from one to the other but never the way back or something right how do they interact with um ui for example, if they look at one of those starships, right? Do they look first at the starship, then the UI, first at UI starship? Do they do a lot of a lot of looking around because they don't get it or they're confused, right? So you can draw some con con like some information from this abstraction of the data. Um, and you can then compare users and it's all independent of different perspective or different times of what pe when people did things, right? Um, yeah. And this gives us a much more interesting um, aspect of, of behavior than if you only use um, heat maps, for example. You mentioned about city. Do you have any experience with zooming in on small panels like a game map when the eye fixates on it? Uh, it becomes, I think, zooming in, as far as I understand. How to make it a smooth transition that doesn't distract or confuse the user? I will ask to Yasmin to you or Alex. Alexander, do you have any experience on game map? It's actually quite an interesting use case. I think whenever you think about zooming in, you need to consider that people don't really respond well to movement in VR when they are themselves stationary, right? Because our system is not like our equilibrium yeah. system is not matching with this visual input of movement. So I think um, whatever you do, maybe try not to move like everything they're seeing because they will probably get sick or might get out of balance. So in this case, again, maybe it's good to do a blackout instead of a zoom in, right? Disrupt the visual yeah. input, then fade in again, or maybe use some kind of small object they can move around where they can zoom in. But I would never, like, I'm not, not a game designer, right? But from the perspective of science, don't make everything move. It will mess up their, um, their visual and equilibrium system. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with Jasmine. She's absolutely right. Uh, that's why I'd say for three out of three of our games, we try to keep the user stationary and we're not moving the world around them as much as possible because users can get nauseated and feel sick. So I wouldn't zoom in to the world around them. However, you can zoom in to elements within the game. So whether it's the 3D object expanding in front of them or the UI, that is something that we've done. Like for instance, the health bars, if you take a longer look at the health bar, rather than being a, a smaller object, it will then expand. So it's something that everybody can see more friendly to the eyes. And so in those cases, I would recommend move the UI, but definitely don't move the world and don't have too much expanding around the user. Perfect. Uh, quick question. Can Toby only track focal position on the 2D plane or can it detect focal depth as well? We cannot hear you, John. Oh. Because I'm double muted. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For security. <laughs> um, we, do, we do a lot of eye tracking in, in different form factors. So the core technology for measuring direction for both eyes are there. Um, when you get into the head and actually implementation into a headset, it'll depend a little bit on what the APIs look like. Um, there is standardization work going on. Uh, under something called OpenXR. Some of you might have seen the OpenXR interfaces. And, and in there, you'll notice that you get one, uh, one point, um, or what, actually you get one vector, I should say, from the starting from between, between the user eyes um, where the user is, is looking. So that's typically what you find, that's what you're gonna find in, in the easily available um, headsets. Yeah. If this question comes from a research side, then there are more research tools that will allow for more in-depth analysis as well, both from Toby and from other okay. vendors. So uh, actually a very important uh, follow-up question. I believe there is five or six major headset providers either about to have eye tracking or they mm -hmm. already announced, right? Of course, not not all of them. Are. Toby, they may have their own things, etc. So you mentioned about standards and OpenXR. So if I build or eye tracking features, whatever feature it is in one of the headsets, 
what is the porting cost <laughs> towards <laughs> others, right? Dilmer knows these kind of things. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fairly there. small and it's shrinking. I think Alexander is, I see Alexander is smiling because he's definitely in that seat of having to support all the different platforms. I think I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll let you speak to that, Alexander. Yeah, It's more yeah. believable. <laughs> will we, will we, the question is, will we um, a little bit regret that we add eye tracking if you want to bring it to other headsets afterwards? That's no, a really, like an honest answer I need. <laughs> yeah, no, the honest answer is I, I don't think so um, because we, we do make a point of trying to port to as many headsets as possible and we're on most of them. And so it's been an easy transition whether the headset has eye tracking or not. If it has eye tracking, then it's a very fast transition. Like during our development process, for instance, we were using uh, the HTC headset with eye tracking in order to do the development because I could sit at my workstation and I could very quickly just throw it on, test something quick, do that like iterative testing. And then when we wanted to test for mobile development, then we'd move it over to Pico's headset that has eye tracking. And happy to say and not paid to say it that Toby's SDK worked beautifully. There were no changes necessary moving between like the HTC headset and the Pico headset the SDK just worked. And so that was really good. And that's great to cut down development time. Um, and even like we got a question in the Q&A about like Quest One or some of the older headsets that don't offer eye tracking. And one of the things that I appreciated about the Toby SDK and you know the different implementation practices is sometimes there's in-betweens to still make use of the features. So like even gaze detection, if people use gaze detection more intelligently than it's been used in the past, like they would the eye tracking, then even on those headsets, you know, that maybe don't offer it yet, or, um, or for some reason the user is not using it, then you can still make use of those features that you implemented by taking advantage of the gaze detection in terms of like where your head is physically turned and looking, that actually is a bit of contextual information that even if you didn't know where the eyes were looking would help you out. So not a lot of porting opportunity costs lost. Okay, perfect. Uh, another follow-up question that's I think the another maybe important part people will consider, <clears throat> isn't it complex for the user to change between eye tracking action and controller actions? Or does it make it easier for the user and is it fluent? Um, I'm asking that because uh, Dilmer, you also remember, right? In the beginning, we had either ha hand tracking or controller, right? Now it is so seamless. Whenever I remove the controllers, immediately hand tracking is. So are we uh, able to already see that today or um, how, how much seamless we can create? So we actually... Um, basically uh, give this as a feature, uh, as a default feature in our games or apps. Yeah, I can speak to what I know. I know the guys that, that do Toby, they do this on a daily basis. So this is me prototyping on a day. <laughs> so with the with the movement SDK, it's it's fairly easy at the beginning. Like you said, with hand tracking, it was, was a pain because you had to go to the scriptable object and then enable whether you wanted hands or you want a controller and then it was only one version, hand tracking didn't work uh, that well. And if you didn't have it in the field of view, then the thing wouldn't detect it. Then you started crossing your hands and uh, with V2 and, and they they just been making improvements to that computer vision API. With, with, with eye tracking, it's actually, it's actually too easy that it makes me feel like I'm cheating as a developer because, <laughs> because it, I mean, the way that the developers did it is just sim simply a, a, an OVR gaze, a eye gaze component that you just drag into a game object, and they have they have it in a way where you can set it, uh, you can you can track the position and also the rotation, and rotation is just basically the vector for the rotation of the eye, and then you also get the position whether you want to use the tracking the head tracking space. Uh, or uh, you know different spaces that they have available. So yeah, it, it is fairly easy to implement. Uh, I mean, going to a different headset, uh, specifically with the Oculus Sync integrations, they they really made it. I, I don't know that Meta is the best of thinking about cross-platform, and I'm sure the guys here uh, agree on that. They have their own version of OpenXR. So uh, yeah, if you if you're thinking about it, I, I would 
look into the XR toolkit if you want to think more across platform and see how you can extend some of the functionality by using the Oculus XR plugin. Uh, but, but don't start one way or the other. I think that's just something to, because it's not like really open XR, it's another layer on top of open XR and it has its own little tweaks. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have still a couple of more questions, so let's try to finish as much as we can. Uh, are there dead zones for tracked eyes and do they vary by user? Can some users have trouble focusing on certain areas of the field of view? There are differences between people, um, but usually it's it behaves pretty much the same. The more the closer to the nose, nose pointer, the better accuracy. And then as you start to look, glance to the sides, um, yeah, eye tracking systems typically have more problem uh, um, <clears throat> tracking. Remember though, when you say field of view, don't, don't mix this up with the headset field of view. The headset field of view is huge, but most of that is only used peripherally. Anytime I wanna look over here, I'm actually going to, I'm not going to do this because that makes my eyes hurt. I'm actually going to move my head. And when I do that, like the displays obviously move. So the eyes only move in a very, very small cone, which is fairly straightforward. Um, so that's a long, that's a long about way of saying, no, not, not really a problem. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's continue. Uh, does Toby provide an API that covers all the features of the trackers or a subset of the features. Will these APIs work with integrated units with HDMI, uh, HMDs, sorry? So for some headsets, um, Toby, Toby has developer tools, uh, advanced developer tools for researchers and specialized applications. So if you're working on, for example, Pico, the Pico headsets uh, with Toby eye tracking, there are ways of using add-on middleware from Toby that enhances the capabilities, uh, but it varies from headset to headset. Perfect. So um, what is the best practice for usability UX testing for a game like this, probably referring to the Starcade Arcade, uh, out on the Quest Vive community, or you hire people locally and set up the headset in office? So it's. I think they are asking probably user testing, right? So what is your user testing best practices usually? Yeah, I would say definitely there was some conversation on heat maps and gathering data and analytics from those, and those would be best. I would say if you're a small studio such as ourselves, then you're going to rely a bit more on the anecdotal feedback of user testing. So kind of your traditional UI, UX research where you observe user play the game, you don't give them direction or you give them specific directions to test something, and then you ask them questions and get feedback afterwards. That's just kind of what you have to do at some point, um, especially like when you're starting off. And the the advice I would always give is try to find new testers. You know, your mom loves you. And so my mom at least always tells me how wonderful my game is and, and not what I need to improve. And so you wanna kind of move outside the circle Game conventions pre-COVID were the best source of testing for us because in a single day, we would demo our game multiple, you know, several hundred times with users that have never played our game before and have no vested interest in our studio. And so you'll get a lot of learnings just by watching players go through it and interact with it. And now that, you know, travel is opening up again, maybe we can go back to game conventions but I, you know, I always encourage indie developers and developers to put your content in front of as many people as possible as early as possible. It will give at least make you start collecting data, right, from users. Yes, so. yes. And they may not tell you exactly like what you need to fix. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that one of the biggest pieces of feedback I heard consistently was your game is stressful. Right. I mean, that doesn't give me any technical information on what to fix. That's your job as a developer to kind of, or, you know, even as a researcher to take that feedback and understand exactly why they're saying it and then what the actionable insight is from that. 
if you hear it multiple times, it's probably something you need to address. Exactly. So um, is it possible to get the raw stream data from the eye tracking camera? There is actually, uh, I would also combine this with, if we don't ask a privacy related questions, it would not be a, a full uh, uh, covering every topic. So I'm asking combining this together. So what kind of data that normally eye tracking tracks or records or sends somewhere? So yeah. how we can evade these privacy issues? Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. The privacy is is a very large concern. It's something we spent a lot about time thinking about it, Toby. Our stance in general there is to is sort of twofold. Uh, one is to contain that kind of information as much as possible, uh, either in hardware by actually designing hardware that like doesn't propagate those things out of a particular section of, of the chipset. Um, or in in the data algorithms, or how far it's stored, or in in developer license agreements. Like there are multiple barriers, and the earlier you stop it, the the more effective it gets. So that's on the one side, and we work a lot with OEMs where we deliver our technology to to make sure that they are thinking about these things as well. So some manufacturers are very very privacy concerned and and tend to like stop all those streams far far down in the hardware stack and it's absolutely impossible for anybody to get about in other cases we and oems are actually developing research tools where you do want to enable yeah. researchers to have for access to this applications, and for right? medical applications yeah. or for pure research applications they're like yeah. neurological research where vr the vr platform is super powerful um, so Toby has head one eye trackers that allow for getting access to eye images, but then those are sold in a context where it's, it, it is research and uh, customers of users are typically under ethical guidelines and, and things like that. Um, so I think the big, the concern comes from what happens when we push this out to every, everybody and their mother uh, and Alexander's mother. Um, yeah <laughs> like do does this leak um and i think you'll see that there are a lot of initiatives to to think about this and it is being limited in developer license agreements in hardware and so on already exactly exactly at least i think compared to the outside cameras inside cameras at least you can take the permission and then move forward but i think outside cameras when we especially think of AR headsets, it's yeah. much more difficult to yeah. handle because you don't know who you are recording, etc. You cannot take permission from the people from streets. So I think this is a much bigger privacy issue. Uh, another follow-up, let's, uh, anyways, we, we need to re, uh, finish in a few minutes maybe, but follow-up question, accessibility-wise, uh, are you seeing some accessibility-related uh, use cases? Or one question from Neurosam, uh, did you come across some library which maps eye tracking data to controller headset inputs to make existing apps accessible? Actually, this might be quite interesting to create some, this kind of like a workflow so uh, you can quickly make your uh, game or app accessible. I don't know what you say, Dilman, but my thoughts go straight again to to XR tool, you know, MR toolkit uh, and Unity XRI, um, where a lot of those mappings happen. There are some initiatives about accessibility um, out there for accessibility in AR and VR that are fairly active. Um, there are also some companies do great job on just making their games um, accessible. I, I watched a talk from Shell Games who make the games uh, I Expect You to Die uh, back at GDC. And they have apparently internally developed a great framework for making games accessible. Um, and have like a long checklist that they go through and that they shared, but it's just good developer practice. And it turns out good accessibility typically comes from the side of, of people with physical, like catering for people with physical users with physical disabilities. But at the end, it turns out to be really just really good usability for everyone quite often. So I just encourage anybody to keep a checklist of accessibility when you make your applications and they'll probably turn out much better than than they would if you didn't have that perspective with you. Exactly. And with all this tracking data, I think uh, there is a lot to, to do for the accessibility side. Absolutely. Perfect. I mean, uh, we need to wrap up. Uh, 
as far as I see, maybe a few small questions left, but uh, we have finished most of them, and some of them are being answered also by our uh, experts here. So thanks for joining us today. It was quite a long session. Uh, thanks for taking the time and sharing your expertise and best practices with, with the audience here. Uh, this session will be uh, already like recorded already. So we will share with the people who registered for the event um, and we will continue doing this open lecture. So it is just the beginning. It's a year long event series. We have different uh, open lectures on cross platform, on um, uh, optimization, shaders, um, mixed reality pass through. So there are a lot of um, different use cases and best practices coming up. Exciting times ahead, definitely lots of headsets are launching as well. So uh, any last words or any, any last comments before we move forward? Thank you for having us here. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. For Thank joining. you, guys. I, I really appreciate everyone and, and all the attendees. And let's build the future. And this is the people that will build it. Exactly, exactly. Definitely, Dimash. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jan, Jasmine, Tilman. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Looking guys. forward to seeing what you're building. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.